A biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. This is an election season and only 10 days out from the state election in Queensland and you might be wondering if there are dimensions of our Christian faith that are in conflict with policies on all sides of the political divide. And in Queensland, Labor wants to win a fourth term in government, uh, while the Liberal National Party wants to win back power for the first time since 2015. You might even remember that time, uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk ousted Campbell Newman. Well, let's make the opportunity today to seek some Christian wisdom around the policies being put forward by the major parties. Early voting opened yesterday, so people are already casting their votes in Queensland. Uh, One report I saw, something like 280,000 Queenslanders have already voted, and that only opened on Monday. Well, Queensland Election Day is the 26th of October, and there is an ACT election on this weekend, Saturday the 19th. Two guests joining us, Rob Norman, the Australian Christian Lobby Queensland State Director. Hello, Rob. Welcome along. Neil, great to be with you, mate. And Lyle Shelton leads the Family First Party, standing around 50 candidates in seats all over Queensland. Lyle Shelton, a special welcome along to you. Neil, thanks so much. Um, yeah, we've actually got almost 60, 59 candidates. Okay. So uh, we're all right. very pleased uh, to, to offer that to the voters. Ten more candidates from last time I spoke to you, and it's not that long ago. Yeah. Hey, uh, when we talk about the election, and we'll primarily focus on the Queensland state election, it's the big one, ACT. I don't want to underrate the importance of it. It's clearly important, but uh, we'll give little less attention to the ACT. But there might be listeners who have a question. We'll open our talkback lines very shortly once we've laid a foundation for where we're going with our conversation. But I want to ask you, gentlemen, what you are hearing on the ground. Rob Norman, let me come to you. You are on the ground. You are very active in the way, as a lobbyist, uh, you are a part of this campaign. Uh, What are you hearing? Yeah, now we're talking to a bunch of um, candidates across the the spectrum, Um, the feel is, I guess, that there will be a change of government. Um, that's never certain, of course. And obviously the polls are pointing to uh, a sizable swing could be in the range of 13%. Some people are saying if that happens, it'll be a wipeout. So um, from a lobbyist point of view, that actually presents us with some challenges because you're talking to a situation then where it's a different government perhaps, but um, it's also similar problems because you have a house without an upper house influence that basically can bring in and block bills at will. So it's never we never get to sleep in the lobbying business. It's always uh, active, and um, I'm looking forward to the next season. I think um, depending on how this thing goes, there's a number of issues, of course, that the ACL is interested in, and we'll address those with the new government as it's formed. What about ordinary people on the street or in local churches? I know you visit churches. Uh, what are they feeling? Is there something in a heartbeat uh, of people on the street or of Christian believers? There's a pretty high sense of uncertainty, I think, Neil. I think um, wherever wherever I go, people are asking me what my opinion is, who's going to win and so forth. So I'm not sure whether people listen to the polls. They've probably given up on them, given that they've been so inaccurate over the last couple of terms. Um, but the bottom line is there's uncertainty. There's probably an element of fear in terms of freedom of speech issues and so forth. Um, but the, you know what? The church always survives. Neil, this is one of the the parts of the genius. The church is resilient and uh, we're going to see revival, I believe, and it'll happen whether or not there's a liberal LNP government or a Labor government. Whether or not. Let me come to you, Lyle Shelton, because these days, as you head up uh, Family First, uh, really you've got a finger on the pulse right around Australia. You've got some insight too. We'll get to the ACT shortly, but on these Queensland figures that we are seeing, and polling figures are not always accurate, but of Labor's 51 seats, something like 23 are expected to fall to the LNP. Uh, it could be a, could be a whitewash. Uh, as you're crunching numbers at your end, and you've got 60 candidates standing in seats around Queensland, what are you hearing? Yeah, look, thanks very much, Neil. Um, look, I'm hearing, uh, based on the travels I've done around Queensland, uh, from Cairns to Cool and Gadda and out west, uh, that people are very concerned, as Rob said, about freedom of speech and freedom of religion. I think uh, Christian people in particular have never felt uh, so much pressure 
because of what they believe about things like marriage and gender, uh, the ideology that's been inflicted upon their children. And I think the fact that we've seen, you know, 59 brave Queenslanders willing to put their name on a ballot with the Family First uh, Party brand, that to me is indicative of this concern and people wanting to do something uh, to push back against the negative trends that are coming from both sides of politics. So um, I'm incredibly encouraged by that, that people are willing to respond to the pressure they're feeling, respond to the cultural decline and the political decline and to do something positive by getting into the fray. And with 60 candidates uh, for Family First, I think we could safely say Family First is back in the state of Queensland. And I'll ask you a little later in our conversation about whether there are possibilities that any of your candidates might see some success. Uh, Let me come to issues, and it's very interesting, isn't it? We'll touch on these sorts of social issues and issues around religious freedom which are very important uh, so far as what Christians will be concerned about but more broadly across all Queenslanders youth crime has been a major issue Uh, people are talking about that's being debated health and uh, housing cost of living pressures Uh, Rob what are you hearing on the economic front and uh, there's promises left right and centre very colourful campaign in so far as all of those sorts of promises go yeah, look, people are doing it tough, Neil. I, I just yesterday was uh, my wife and I were going for a drive through the city, and we noticed a, a massive tent city that's popping up, and people just living on the streets. So it, they're definitely doing it tough. Uh, in terms of the youth crime problem, look, like like so many of these things, the presenting issue isn't the actual issue, and um, we mm. believe that pr- that the youth crime is directly attributable to the fact that parents have lost control. And the government isn't helping him in those areas. So parental rights have been eroded over the last 10 years, uh, particularly the last, I think, term of government we've seen that happen. But um, we, we're, we're going to be lobbying the new government, whoever that is and however that looks, for improvements in that area. We, we want to see parents given back uh, the controls of their children's lives. We want to see uh, things like um, confidentialities, uh, at, during, through the school system opened up so that parents can know what's going on at school, particularly with gender ideo- ideology and what their kids are learning. We believe that those things really feed into the fundamentals of society and that's why you see uh, decaying youth crime rates, increased economic issues. I know Lyle can speak to the economic stuff more than I can, but they are definitely symptomatic of a sick society. Well, let me come to you, Lyle Shelton. Uh, One of the uh, LNP's policies is adult time for adult crime. Uh, I know there's all sorts of complexities around that, but uh, it's a very catchy thing that seems to have caught on in the community, especially those communities where youth crime has become a huge issue, and there's very few communities that are not being touched by rising levels of crime. Uh, What are your perceptions on uh, issues around youth crime? Look, I think you've got to have a deterrence. I think if, if young people are offending, there, there has to be a deterrent, there has to be punishment, but that needs to be nuanced as well with how do we as a community uh, help young people be diverted away from the criminal justice system where possible. I totally agree with, with Rob. I think uh, just cracking down on a tough on crime thing is not enough. Um, we've got to get back to um, the, the issue of families. There's no doubt that... Uh, the biggest uh, cause of, of criminal activity is family breakdown and particularly fatherlessness. Now, you know, David Crucifelli and his tough on crime uh, mantra isn't even talking about ways to make families more resilient and stay together. If we can improve the family unit, encourage mums and dads uh, by taking some of the financial pressure off them, that's a big cause of family breakdown and fatherlessness, uh, as well as the social problems of pornography and gender fluid ideology and the, the negative cultural influences. Um, these are the things we need to be addressing to to make families strong and that's going to have an impact on crime in the future. Uh, let me divert to something perhaps a little lighter and uh, it's not the usual sort of, you know, get in with the heavy stuff that we like to do. But uh, in this day and age, image is so important for any politician and uh, every politician wants to look good. Uh, some reports suggest that David Crisofoli looks 
very good, like good premiership material. And, uh, of course, the comparison comes to Stephen Miles, who's often criticised for uh, what some would say is a wonderful beaming smile, and others say that there's a smirk there that I don't like. Um, What are your thoughts here, Rob, around the image of these two leaders? People will typically uh, cast their vote according to the leader of the party, it's very presidential style, isn't it? But uh, what are your thoughts around the image of these leaders as they go into the election? Yeah, look, I, that's just a very good point, Neil. I think um, Australian politics has become very much more like American politics, and we've become fixated on on image. So uh, what we need to remember and understand is that both the major parties will have machines behind that. And so there, there will be a PR campaign going on. They'll be uh, they'll be bound to a certain script, and we've seen that in recent weeks, particularly with the opposition leader, that he's stuck to the script very uh, in a very disciplined way, sometimes disappointing people in what uh, he is and isn't saying. Uh, so they're both very – they're being very choreographed. There's no doubt about that. And, um, you know, they're, they're going to try and attract – they're going to try and speak to particular audiences. Um, so we need to remember when we're listening to, to leaders that we need to read between the lines, not – not look at the image, but listen to the content. And I think uh, as Christian uh, you know, people, we can discern and we can listen and we can do our own research. We must do that. What do you make of this, Lyle Shelton? Because uh, there you have you know, a fresh set of candidates, 60 family-first candidates in electorates all over the state of Queensland, uh, but people are tending to vote according to the image and the personality of the two leaders. And so when you've got local candidates on a local uh, ballot form, um, does this work against uh, organisations like yours at Family First? Look, it can do, Neil. I've been looking at the social media of uh, Stephen Miles and David Crisofilli. They both put up very slickly produced uh, videos. Uh, There's a constant flow of it. Um, I think a lot of it lacks authenticity. I think um, it's a mistake to get caught up in the the whole image. Um, I I think a lot of it's very superficial and contrived. And particularly, um, and I will be critical of David Crucifelli, he's running a very small target approach. So there's all these, you know, curated uh, social media videos. But uh, what does he actually stand for? Um, He's he's running a small target um, campaign, hoping to fall over the line. Uh, based on the incompetence of um, of the Miles government and, and successive Labor governments that have run up massive debt and, and driven the state into the ground on so many issues. Uh, so I don't like that approach. I'd like to see more substance, less style. I think social media is obviously a good thing. I don't mind us seeing a little bit of, of who the real leaders are and some of the behind-the-scenes stuff, but um, t- too much of it is, is, in my view, superficial and contrived, and uh, we're not seeing enough substance from, from either leader. We're 10 days out from the Queensland state election. Uh, There's an ACT election that's happening this coming Saturday on the 19th. Uh, 10 days out and people are already casting their votes. Uh, and People have already made up their minds. Uh, Interesting, isn't it? And I'll come to you, Rob Norman. When we say that we would hope that Christian listeners uh, might be voting according to a Christian conscience... Do you find that Christian believers are, you know, they're just uh, swept along with the publicity and the campaigns? Or are you finding that there is a little bit of a change happening and people are saying, well, wait a minute, those sorts of policies are in conflict with my Christian ethics? Does this come through in any of your conversations? Yeah, it does. I think that's a great point. Um, I'm actually really encouraged. I think uh, Christians around the nation are becoming more interested in politics. I've noticed that pastors are becoming more interested in well and communicating better with their congregations. As an ex-pastor, I understand that. I believe it's important that we speak to the uh, to the congregations in terms of what's happening around us. And politics is one of the... Everybody has a political view. Uh, we're all involved in politics. That word politics is an interesting word. It, it means it means the affairs of the city. And so as, as uh, pastors and leaders speak to those issues... I've seen an uptick in interest. Um, our website at qldvotes.org.au has been hammered. We've had lots of hits on it. So people are doing their research. They're, they're looking at each candidate and what they stand for and party views and so forth. So I think we can be in- encouraged at that. I think we're uh, cut above the average in terms of the way religious people are looking at politics. Helping you make sense of life, culture and current events from a biblical perspective. 2020. 
on Vision. Our talkback line is open on 1800 316 316. You might want to join in our conversation. We are talking politics. We're talking elections. There's one on this weekend in the ACT on Saturday, and then we're 10 days out from the Queensland state election on the 26th of October. Two guests with us, Rob Norman, the ACL Queensland State Director, and Lyle Shelton, who leads the Family First Party, standing almost 60 candidates in seats all over the state of Queensland. Uh, gentlemen, let's take a call from a listener before we uh, get into some other issues around religious freedom. Tim is in Red Bank in Red Bank Creek, Creek in Queensland. Hello, Tim. Welcome. Good day, Neil. Good day, uh, uh, Lyle. Our, sorry. Yep, our um, guest. Yep. What are your thoughts? Well, I was quite disappointed. I got a notification from <clears throat> Four BC the other day. Come through on my phone. Oh, there's going to be a debate. Uh, between the potential leaders of the new government. And it was, surprise, surprise, the Labor leader and the LNP leader. And I thought, well, why hasn't why isn't the potential leader of Family First, One Nation or the Greens or whatever, why aren't they in the debate as well? And just made me think, maybe naively, is the, me- is the mainstream media just a mouthpiece of the Uniparty, which is the LNP and Labor? And... Uh, if I may indulge in two other issues before... Uh, we'll just I touch on this one first, Tim. Uh, yeah. I'll come to you, Lyle Shelton, because it does seem that the major parties uh, do like to sew everything up and uh, keep minor parties out. Uh, what are your thoughts here for Tim? Yeah, look, Tim, I appreciate your concern. Um, look, the reality is, uh, as much as Family First would love to be filling the Treasury benches uh, in George Street, um, that isn't going to happen anytime soon. Um if we keep at it long enough, it might. But quite rightly, I think it's appropriate for the, the media to, to focus on who the parties of government are when they're trying to you know, present these debates between the leaders. So I don't begrudge that at all. Uh, just so long as we get a, a fair go um, you know, locally and, and, and with, with the other issues, the fact that the, the media note that we're in the race and that we're raising issues which um, are not popular with the mainstream parties... But uh, the reality is Family First or One Nation or anyone else isn't going to form government, so there's no problem with them taking that approach. Tim, you had something else to add. Well, I'd like to know why why you think that's the case, Lyle. I mean, I, I, would, I would say, maybe again naively, that it's the, the, the disengaged voter base that, that perpetuates the reality of the two-party system. I mean, like... If people really did take their vote seriously, would there be more serious contenders in the race for government? Lyle? Yeah, look, that, that, that's a really good point, Tim, and I, I agree with you there. That, that's why we are uh, going to the trouble to field 59 candidates, and I, I really have to pay tribute to Alex Todd, our Queensland campaign director, who's really managed a lot of this and, and um, got the candidates together. But um, that's why we're doing this, because we live in a participatory democracy and we can participate. Um, We are new into a rebuild of the party after it was closed down for many, many years. So I just think over time, um, as we build and show people that uh, we're out there, that we are offering a positive alternative to to both major parties, which have both dropped the ball on family, faith, freedom and life, uh, that uh, we can engage more and more people. So this is just the start for us. We're in it for the long haul. And if people like yourself, Tim, um, you know, can can get behind us and support us, we'd be, we'd be grateful. We've got to prove that we can build a movement over time and that will then attract um, more attention from the media and the general public. Rob Norman, have you got something to contribute there? I think, Tim, you raise a great point. And so what we've seen over the last decades uh, in politics is that we've seen a falling primary vote in both the major parties. And that, to me, speaks of uh, an electorate that's not content with the major parties and where they're heading and the role of minor parties may increase. I think it is increasing. Um, the current you know, s- speculation is that we could see a, a government with 40% primary vote. Uh, we haven't, those numbers are, are unprecedented in terms of being low. And so parties like the Family First and the Catter Australian Party, One Nation, etc., they all have a role to play. And um, so you make a good point, Tim. I do agree with Lyle in as much as uh, this is about who the governing party will be, and people need to hear that as well. So it's a very good point you've raised. I think stick at it, mate. Tim in Red Bank Creek, thank you so much for your call. Uh, I'll leave you with those uh, couple of questions that you've, you've mentioned. 
Let me ask you, though, because, you know, obviously politicians or candidates want to get in front of the people face to face. And uh, the Australian Christian Lobby, Rob, uh, you've been running Meet the Candidate forums. Uh, No doubt there's been an extensive number of those uh, in Queensland in the lead up to the Queensland state election. And oftentimes the gatherings at those forums are bigger than a lot of the uh, other platforms that candidates get to stand in front of. So actually you're providing a service for whole communities by having those forums. Yeah, those forums are being run by Freedom for Faith, Neil, and they're doing a great job. They've got it right in the face of of uh, churches and people in churches. They've spoken the right language. They've invited all the candidates in, and they are a really important part of what happens in the Christian landscape when it comes to the elections. So we've done a webinar. We've done some other things. We tend to do more town hall-style meetings now in terms of the lead-in to elections, but they all play a role, and they inform people on policies and, as Lyle says, the transparent part, the back end of politics. So we we break past the image part and we get into the, the actual content. And no doubt for listeners wondering if there are any of those that are happening in your community, just check out that uh, qldvotes.org.au website and uh, see if you can find the dates uh, for one of those happening near you. I want to come to some of the issues. Uh, Obviously, as Christian believers, we're concerned about religious freedom, uh, which is really one of those foundation freedoms that we all want to see maintained and there are all sorts of things that are chipping away at that. Uh, I wonder if I just come back to you first, Rob, on what's been happening on the ground uh, in Queensland, the Respect at Work bill in particular, which took a lot of people by surprise. Uh, what's what's happening with religious freedom in the state of Queensland? Uh, hit us with the facts. Hit us with, you know, as hard as you can so that we understand what's happening with religious freedom in the state of Queensland. The, the root of the problem with religious freedom really goes back to the establishment of the Queensland Human Rights Commission back in 2019. We, we believe that's right. It's a honeypot for activists. And so what we see is a bunch of activists in that organisation that are determining policy for the government. So that the current Labor government has gone to the Q- Queensland Human Rights Commission. They've asked them to put up a new framework for a new anti-discrimination act. And so we've seen a couple of, couple of permutations of that. And the most recent is this Respected Work and Other Matters Amendment Bill. Now, that bill is a Trojan horse. It carries all sorts of issues with it that restrict freedom of speech, that lower the uh, threshold of vilification, that introduce doubt and uncertainty in what can be said and what can't be said. And what we discover in those situations, people tend to say less because they're fearful of uh, recrimination. Um, And so the bottom line is, Neil, that bill was passed in the last week of Parliament. It will become active on the 1st of July next year. So it's that complex that it's going to take them that long to actually put a framework in. Lyle Shelton, uh, this is no surprise uh, to you. You were anticipating these things for many, many years, that these things would come before our parliaments. Uh, What is your understanding about this, as uh, Rob describes it, a Trojan horse? It has passed the Queensland Parliament. It does affect religious freedom from July next year. It's a shocking piece of legislation, Neil. Um, It overlays um, even further uh, constraints on freedom of speech and freedom of religion on top of already very, very bad legislation going back to the Anti-Discrimination Act. Um, You'll be aware and many of your listeners will be aware that I'm currently tied up in a four-year legal action because two drag queens are suing me for saying they are dangerous role models for children, which they are. And I've been tied up uh, through the Queensland human rights uh, process um, under the Anti-Discrimination Act, uh, through the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal and um, and many others like me for simply saying things about gender um, and and protecting children from this harmful ideology. So the Respect at Work bill takes that to another level. Um, It really puts even more pressure on Christian schools and churches. So it's terrible legislation. And and this is why Family First is running. We, We want to... Um, be a voice uh, for those who who would say that we would want to see this sort of legislation repealed. We'd want to see the Anti-Discrimination Act amended so there's not subjective um, vilification provisions based on so-called protected attributes around gender identity and sexual orientation. These things um, shouldn't, you know, be barriers to freedom of speech. And particularly if you want to speak about Christian morality and the truth about biology, uh, these are real vulnerabilities that have existed in law for a long time. 
and they're empowered by the Human Rights Commission, which is not really a Human Rights Commission, it's a Human Wrongs Commission, <laughs> as I've discovered through personal experience. Yes, and, uh, you know, this is a labour law. It is already passed. Uh, you use an interesting word that I've been drawing attention to now for some time, Lyle, that word repeal. But, uh, you know, just so listeners uh, don't think that we're taking one side or another here, uh, repeal is not on the agenda for the LNP. Am I right, Rob? Is that uh, Have you been hearing things? Have you been talking to MPs about what they might do about this Trojan horse bill that's already passed? Uh, is repeal on the lips of anyone on the more conservative side of government? No, I doubt they'd use that language, uh, Neil, but what they have done is they've, they've given us an assurance that they will... Uh, that they will reform. So they're going to re-look at this. And there is a chance that before the 1st of July next year, before the Act is actually enacted, that it will have been reformed. And so they're saying they're going to consult extensively with the community again, talk to churches, etc. That That is a promise. We, we received that in an email. Um, it doesn't contain the word repeal. I'd love to see a repeal. I think we're already over-regulated in that space and freedom of speech is already under threat. So... Uh, but I, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. I think we do have some, some space for lobbying um, if there is a change of government. Back to some of the economic challenges that are going on in the state of Queensland because lots of people, no doubt, all around Australia will have been hearing about the big spending promises that are happening, perhaps even on both sides. I'll come to you, uh, Lyle Shelton. Uh, what are you uh, understanding about the big, stend- big spending state of our uh, of our political parties? Well, I'm very concerned about it, Neil. Um, uh, Queensland's in $172 billion worth of debt. Uh, Labor promised $8.9 billion in additional spending during the election campaign, including offering 50 cent public transport fees, government run petrol stations, $1,000 power rebates, and free school lunches, free stuff from the government. But it's all coming out of the taxpayer's pocket. And this is, um, this is a fool's errand uh, because uh, government spending always fuels inflation. Inflation is what's eating away at the uh, cost of living uh, of families and uh, it, it contributes to family breakdown in a, in a big way. So um, this idea that you can throw government money uh, to try and make people feel better, uh, it'll always come back to bite you. It's a false economy and uh, the debt is a real worry. It's a form of intergenerational theft. And uh, Queensland's a very resource-rich state with mining and agriculture. There is no reason it should be in this much debt. Uh, they're, they're pursuing these, both sides of politics, pursuing these crazy net zero policies, which is ramping up the cost of electricity. All of this is hurting family budgets. And um, the econo- not just the social policy is out of whack, the economic policy is out of whack. Rob Norman, uh, when there is a sugar hit, uh, people refer to this big spending, uh, the promises that are made, the $1,000 energy rebate in Queensland, reduced car registration, as Lyle mentioned, the 50 cent bus and train fares, uh, free lunches for children, the latest uh, this week. Uh, and and the, these sugar hits... Uh, for people who are not thinking very deep, deeply about some of the more dramatic issues that we're talking about, those things look pretty attractive, don't they? And a cost of living crisis, uh, a little bit of relief here and there, uh, would certainly be trying to sway a lot of voters just to continue voting Labor. Dead right, Neil. Look, I think I think these sorts of sugar hits, as you call them, are actually an insult to the electorate. People are much smarter than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you think about it, in fact... A 50-cent bus fare is not going to help somebody that lives at Mount Isa, for instance. Um, and a school lunch, I think that's a, that's a great thing in, in some ways, but the, uh, the, the schools are actually not happy with it either because the pressure that it puts on them is, is horrendous. That's not their core <clears throat> business. We'd be much better off, as Lyle said, supporting families in economic ways so that they can actually provide lunches for their kids. So this is a sugar hit. It's a short-term fix. Okay, uh, let's take some more calls. David is in Cairns. Hello, David. Welcome. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> what are your thoughts, David? Um, when I left the army, I got involved in counting at the 1987 election and have since been counting and scrutineering. My son's now done the same. But uh, when I was living in Adelaide, g'day, Rob, um, I was counting and um, this myth that, you know, that's put out by the major parties that if you vote for an independent or a small party, you wasted your vote. No, it does not, in my experience. 
And so putting family first in uh, aligns with Christian values. And if there's not a one uh, family first candidate, then the next party close to. And the ACL is a, a wonderful uh, appraisal of all candidates and where they stand on issues. And so, yeah, your, your primary vote is making a difference. David, you make a very good point here. I'll come to Lyle Shelton because, uh, you know, is it a waste uh, to put a one in our preferential voting system uh, in a minor party uh, like Family First? Uh, I know you're going to say, of course, it's it's not, but, uh, but there is this concern, isn't there, that people think that when they do cast a vote uh, for not the major party that maybe their bo- vote is wasted. How does that preferential voting favour uh, those particular candidates that might hold a Christian view of the ethics around this election? You know, D- David's absolutely right. Um, a vote for a minor party is not a wasted vote. It's actually a more powerful vote. It sends a message to both sides of politics, which have dropped the ball on issues of uh, family, faith, freedom and life, uh, that there's a constituency out there who cares about that. Um, now, you know, I'll, I'll be very honest, it's very difficult for family first candidates to get elected in a unicameral parliament like Queensland has. There's only there's no upper house, which which is where minor parties generally do better around Australia. But we're running nonetheless because there's a gap, uh, there's a vacancy uh, in these issues and um, our courageous candidates are stepping up to put those values on the ballot paper. Uh, but if our people don't get elected, the number two vote then goes to the candidate or the party of your choice. The voter is in control of where the preferences go. Uh, a number one for Family First is absolutely not a waste. You'll hear the major parties say minor parties Uh, votes are a waste. It's not true. It's a lie. Uh, But your number two vote, if we don't get elected, uh, goes to your next preference and then so on down the ticket. David in Cairns, I want to say thank you so much for making a good contribution there. Need to take another call, though. Let's hear from Warren, who is in Broken Hill in New South Wales. Hey, Warren, welcome. G'day. Yeah, just with the vilification law, um, I noticed Labor put it through. I rang through to Sarah Hampson Young's office in South Bay uh, a few weeks back to, and all I got was an answering machine. Out of the 250 Baptist churches in Victoria, they seemed to go for it, you know. But this actual bill that went through is actually getting challenged in the USA with the Seventh-day Adventists. You've got to be a paid tithe member to become a member of their their sect the or their church and you've got to also be baptized and what they found is a lot of them are just pulling out the gay people that are in their churches over there so i dare say it will probably be challenged Warren, I think you're touching on some things here, uh, probably a conversation for another day to be able to unpack some of the depth that you're going there because uh, even when you're talking about Baptist churches in Victoria and uh, the way that they are in support of some of those issues uh, Mm -hmm. around uh, uh, things that might even support a vilification of Christians, which sounds a little bit uh, counterintuitive, if if there is a a quick response here, perhaps uh, Lyle Shelton, uh, if you can respond to Warren. Look, uh, well, Rob, Rob might even be a better place. I picked up through the ACL E News uh, the other week about these changes to vilification laws in Victoria, which are a real worry. It seems like uh, another attempt at the sort of Queensland uh, respected work type approach. Yeah, look, unfortunately, these anti discrimination laws are changing all around the world, and it seems like the whole world's on a unity ticket. Australia is the same. Um, of course, the Queensland uh, Respected Work Bill is pro- it's the worst we've seen in Australia. But, um, yeah, it's dead right. There, there, there are challenges coming from all over the place, federally and through the states as well. And you've got to be so careful and aware as a Christian believer and as a member of a local church and a member of a denomination because, as I understand it, uh, there are even churches that are saying, we'll help. Uh, to implement these anti-vilification laws uh, in our church. And really that has impact on what can be preached from the pulpit. And uh, this is where religious freedom is so important because uh, we need for our Christian leaders to be able to have freedom to be able to say what the Bible teaches about these ethics that we rely on for 
the sorts of things that bring a harmony in our Christian life and harmony to our communities. But I want to thank Warren for his call. Thank you so much, Warren. Our talkback line is open on 1-800-316-316. So many issues to cover. Let me come to another one of those very important ones and one that has put the abortion issue right front and centre in the Queensland election around issues to do with sanctity of life. Uh, Robbie Catter promised to introduce a bill or some bills that would amend the Termination of Pregnancy Act. Uh, Rob, what is your thought on what's happening with the abortion issue this election? Yeah, Robbie's no uh, stranger to this, Neil. So a process started in a conversation he and I had in the Parliament um, in the cafe, actually, last year around Christmas time. And I spoke to Robbie about um, live births, in other words, babies being born alive after abortions. Um, when Robbie heard about what was happening and some of the testimonies, he became quite emotional. He said, Rob, we have to do something about this. So the the story, the, the process is that he then introduced the Live Births Amendment Bill, um, which has become a major issue. Um, others like Joanna Howe has been involved, the ACL, Cherish Life, etc. We're all working together to to basically revisit the the uh, Termination of Pregnancy Act. And so I think Robbie will introduce a bill or bills. Um, it probably won't be a full repeal of the of that act, but what he will probably do, and I'm, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Catters, but I would suggest that he would probably be looking at um, uh, some amendments to that act and, and beginning to wind it back, looking at issues like third trimester abortions and some of the uh, consequences of that, such as live births, etc. It's a massive issue. Uh, Lyle Shelton, the abortion laws in the state of Queensland, as they are in so many other states and territories around Australia, are simply abominable. And uh, it's important, isn't it, to be able to have candidates standing who will be able to draw attention to uh, the significance and the severity of these laws. Uh, is it is it fair to say that when people are going to be voting for a family first candidate, that they're going to be a pro-life standing person? Absolutely, Neil. We are a pro-life political party. Um, that is one of our core values. In fact, the, the pro-life issue was instrumental in, in the party getting re-established uh, because the Liberals in South Australia were introducing Queensland-style abortion to birth laws, and that's what uh, really got the party going again. So our 59 candidates are all very much motivated by this. I, I want to give real credit to Rob and the ACL and Joanna Howe and, of course, the Catters for the incredible work that's been done to highlight this issue of babies born alive and left to die after abortion. Um, I think, you know, Rob's work uh, with uh, the midwife, Louise Adset, getting her to testify. I know she did that on her own right, but um, not as an ACL person, but she was there with the help of Rob um, and support of him in uh, blowing the whistle on this abomination. And um, uh, that's been very, very powerful. And it's been so disappointing to see the LNP leader, David Crucifelli, uh, asked all last week, almost every day last week in media conferences up and down the state, whether he'd support um, a catastyle repeal or, or amendment to this law and, and him just stonewalling it, saying it's not part of our plan. And, and Neil, you know, I guess the tragedy of all this for me as someone who loves to see Christians involved in politics, whether it's in Family First or in the LNP, but seeing so many of my friends in the LNP who a pro-life people having to spout the party line and say publicly, and in the case of my hometown of Toowoomba, um, people that I know and respect and love, like Trevor Watson, David Janetsky, having to go into the local paper and say, we're not going to change the abortion laws if we win government. And Donna Kirkland, a wonderful Christian lady standing in the seat of Rockhampton, having to stand next to Christopheli last week, even though she'd previously posted on social media saying abortion is the greatest human rights issue of our time, which it is, uh, then having to stand next to Chris Affelli and say that she's going to support no change to these horrible laws. So it just shows how the major parties crush uh, Christians and pro-life people uh, through their bullying and their disciplined messaging and, and, and throwing principles out the window because of politics. It's really sad. Uh, Rob Norman, uh, as we can hear, uh, reflected, difficult for even Christians when they do get elected into the parliament, uh, whether they're in opposition or whether they're in government, uh, to be able to stand for their Christian values. Uh, but if you're not there, you'll never have the opportunity. So uh, if we're looking at, uh, talking about Christians who are candidates and who are members, uh, there any names come to mind? for you uh, that you might be able to identify for listeners uh, to keep an eye on in their electorate, whether we, in, no matter what party they might be in. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I've been encouraged. I did a road trip earlier in the year up 
as far as Townsville, and we identified a whole bunch of candidates, particularly in the LNP, who are definitely Christians and pro-life. And people like uh, uh, Susanna Damianopoulos, even in um, Springwood, she's a great Christian lady. Uh, you've got uh, Amanda Stoker in the seat of Woodgeroo, which, again, doesn't need any introduction. Um, uh, you've got uh, Redcliffe. Um, uh, just can't remember her name. Sorry, Kerry Ann Dooley. <laughs> sorry, Kerry Ann. I'm very sorry. Yeah, Kerry. Again, these are great people. Um, and I, along with Lyle, I really hope that they are able to express their views and that uh, if a bill is raised by Robbie Catter, that ultimately there is a conscience vote. Um, that's what we hope for. I think it would have been a lot less embarrassing for David Chrisofulli had he, in, during the interviews, just said it's not part of our policy at this stage, but if it hits the floor, we always allow our MPs a conscience vote. That would have, that would have dealt mm. with the matter. Uh, you know, this yeah, small that. target strategy uh, that the LNP has, uh, not to come out and say what they will do, uh, because that attracts uh, all sorts of fire from all sorts of directions, uh, do you think that that strategy is likely to be useful for the LNP, Lyle Shelton? I, I think a small target strategy well the answer to your question is yes it will be useful because labor has been so bad um david crucifelli will become the stephen bradbury of australian politics um just falling over the line but I, I i do think it treats us like fools i think it debases our politics i think leaders should lead and they should tell people exactly what they stand for and uh he hasn't done that on so many issues um uh, including obviously the the pro life issues and the pro family issues, they've been very very soft, and um, he's provided very little detail about any agenda that he has. And uh, I think the problem with this Queensland election is that sort of behaviour is probably going to be rewarded. He'll be seen as a political genius for leading the party back into government. But I think the real danger is that um, uh, without an agenda, uh, I think that might come back to bite him. Um, uh, I don't think it's a good long-term strategy, and um, I really hope small target strategy is something that uh, politicians disavow themselves of, and I, I don't want to ever see it again in our politics. Um, I want leaders to lead, and um, I think it's part of the reason why people are so cynical about politicians, because we don't see authenticity and genuineness, and um, this is yet another example of that. Rob Norman, when you stand for election, uh, whether you are a candidate or whether you are the party and you are a small target and you haven't said anything about where you stand on these very, very important issues, uh, there can be no accountability beyond the election. So uh, there's all sorts of pressures come on every government about where they stand on things, but uh, no accountability because we're not seeing the LNP stand for much at all on these social, uh, these social agendas. No, that's exactly right. It obviously makes our our job harder. I'm not expecting a free pass when it comes to uh, political lobbying. It's a tough game. But at the end of the day, uh, there's enough people out there that want answers on this question. Um, and, and the LNP should remember, Neil, that there are, according statistically, according to the ABS, we have one and a half million people that identify as Christian in Queensland. Now, of those, the, the ACL has 50,000 direct supporters. These are people that have issues with when it comes to stuff like pro-life we want answers and uh, i don't think we're isolated and I, and i don't believe the polls i don't believe the narrative that says that 75 percent of people are pro-abortion i i don't know where, what the origins of those polls are but i do not believe it the way we, we're speaking to people and what we hear we're not in an echo chamber we're hearing people say when they hear about live births they are absolutely astounded that a little baby boy could be left for five hours to die without medical attention. And that's, that's the testimony we heard from Louise Ast Adsit. So when people hear that, they're shocked. People are shocked. Uh, people are shocked at what's happening for our governments right around Australia and federally as well. And so uh, we only got a few minutes left for our conversation. I just want to come back to you. Uh, something I said a little earlier, Lyle Shelton, I was going to ask you uh, whether you think there is a chance that a family first candidate might get elected sometime in this election. And let's include the ACT in here uh, because you've got some candidates in the ACT. Uh, what are the chances of a, uh, of a good showing for family first? Look, you know, as I said earlier, Neil, it's very difficult in Queensland with um, no upper house for minor parties. Um, and unless you've got... Um, 
you know, a celebrity type candidate, very difficult. And so we, our team knows this. We've gone into the Queen's election wide awake. We are wanting to put uh, the family values on the ballot paper. This is part of a long term rebuild. Uh, so we're realistic about this, but we think it's necessary because we're able to raise issues that the other parties won't. In terms of the ACT, um, we've got a much better chance there. We've got 11 candidates running in the, uh, the five electorates in the Australian Capital Territory election. And uh, in the last uh, few weeks, um, the Liberals kicked out a very good um, pro-family, pro-life member of Parliament, disendorsed uh, Elizabeth Kickett from their ticket um, because she's pro-family, essentially. So she's joined the Family First Party. Now, she does have a reasonable chance of getting re-elected, and we've reorientated our campaign in the ACT uh, to getting right behind her and putting a lot of resource into her re-election and, um, look, you know, we're really hoping and praying that she does get re-elected because it would send a big message, A, to the Liberals, that they shouldn't kick out pro-family people, and, and B, that uh, to have her voice in probably the most anti-faith, anti-family jurisdiction in the country, which is the ACT parliament, essentially run by a green left uh, government, uh, that would be uh, a huge uh, coup, and um, and it would probably show God's sense of humour uh, in keeping that voice there. So, um that's really our hope and prayer with uh, this weekend's, this Saturday's ACT election. Uh, Rob Norman, we don't ever like to say this is who you should vote for, uh, mm. but it, what comes to mind for you, uh, clearly uh, family first, uh, you're going to have some favour there, but uh, for listeners, and maybe there's not a family first candidate in the electorate they're in, uh, looking for uh, the policy positions of various parties of various candidates uh is there uh, which parties do you think uh ought to get a good showing um maybe you mentioned catters or how do you how do you identify if people are listening and saying uh, as a christian who recognizes there's a real contrast to what my values are and what these parties are standing for uh who do you say is is, is worth voting for yeah, we're never going to tell people who to vote for. Now, let's, we can't do that because of our charity, charitable status. But having said that, we provide enough information for people to make those decisions, and it's really easy to do because when you go through the candidate surveys that we've sent out, it becomes quite obvious who stands for what. Um, the other thing I would encourage people to do on our website, qldvotes.org.au, we also have the voting records of MPs in the past term of Parliament. And what we've learnt, obviously, with uh, with politicians is um, don't don't listen to what they say. Look at what they do, and and I think that's the really important thing. Um, so look at the voting records, read the candidate surveys, do your own homework, talk to them, talk to the candidates as well. At the end of the day, there are some star players. The Family First is obviously a pro life party. Uh, they they state that they are that they live that. The Catters state that they are a pro-life party. We've seen that to be true. They've proven that as well. And to a certain extent, One Nation, though they don't have a pro-life view on euthanasia. So people need to, people need to make their, their, their choices. So you can do research and you can understand what the candidates and what the parties stand for. And those two websites I'll give for listeners now. Uh, worth taking advantage of because the detail on these websites is much, much more significant than at any other time in the past. The sophistication now is giving you a real insight into where the candidates and where the parties are standing. Let me give the Queensland Votes website, qldvotes.org.au. That's the website that is specifically set up by the Australian Christian Lobby for the Queensland state election. Uh, you'll find some detail also uh, on uh, the on the ACL website, no doubt, about the, A- the ACT election and the Family First Party website, familyfirstparty.org.au. And I know that there are some links there for the ACT election as well as the Queensland election. And there will be detail and some resource that you can easily access uh, while you're making decisions about how you vote in the upcoming elections. I want to say thanks to both of our special guests, Rob Norman, the Australian Christian Lobby Queensland State Director. Thanks so much for joining us, Rob. Thanks, Neil. Keep going for it, mate. And Lyle Shelton, who leads the Family First Party, standing almost 60 candidates in seats all over Queensland. Lyle Shelton, thanks so much for your contribution today on 2020. Thanks so much, Neil, and thanks, Rob. 
Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 